we are studying Genesis. Uh, we started, oh my goodness, January? I'm not sure when. And we're just sort of taking our time. We haven't obviously gotten very far, but I'm not, sp speed is overrated is what I've come to conclude. Uh, but we're starting with Noah. And I think we're going to, we last week we did G Genesis 1 to 5, creation, Eden, Cain and Abel, um, etc. And so we're right at Noah. Uh, we'll do three or four weeks on Noah, I think. Then we'll move to Abraham. I don't know how long it'll take us to do Abraham. Uh, but then Jacob and Joseph are uh, wonderful, wonderful character studies. But I have never preached or taught on Noah. So I, and I don't, I'm not even sure I've preached one sermon on Noah in my life. It's so, so it's sort of fun to, 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 I think we'll start by, let me just read. Uh, if you start with your Bible, and then we'll go to the pages. But I, let's just make sure we've got the story in our mind. Tonight is mainly introduction to Noah. I'm actually going to, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do about when I do it. Let, let's, I'm in chapter 6 of Genesis, verse 5. I'm not going to read every verse, but I'm, I'll tell you where I am. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. We talked about that last May, about the doctrine of total depravity. How bad is the sin issue? Well, every intention of the thoughts of man's heart is only evil all the time. Pretty oblique assessment. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. I, 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 the Greeks concept of God, Plato, Aristotle, etc., etc., is that God doesn't have emotions. Because if God had emotions, then that makes him somehow unstable. Or the God of the Bible has passionate emotions. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely, he was grieved, he was sorry he had made man, he feels. That's pretty remarkable when you think that we're talking about God Almighty here. We're not talking about Jesus of Nazareth. We're talking about God Almighty. Okay. He grieved him to his heart. Verse 7. So the Lord said, here we go, I will blot out man. Any other translations than blot out? Okay, yeah. It's the idea of using water to, to wash clean. Using water to wash. Blot out. And water is pretty important in this story. I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I'm sorry that I've made them. But Noah found favor, or a better word is found grace. First reference to grace in the Bible. The world is going to hell, but Noah found grace. Uh, amazing words. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless. Anybody got the King James Version? What does it say rather than blameless? Anybody remember? Perfect. Perfect. Scary word. Noah was righteous, perfect or blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. So there's corruption, which refers to taking something that is in good condition and perverting it to something in bad condition. It's 
um, and violence. Those are the two key words. God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I've determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark, and that word rooms can be translated nests. Pretty like a bird's nest. Um, make rooms in the ark and cover it with pitch. I'm going to come back to that. This is how you are to make it, 300 cubits by 50 by 30. Make a roof and finish it to a cubit above and set a door. How many doors are in the ark? One door and only one, and yet its sides are two. <laughs> uh, that's, that's significant. All right, um, look at verse 18. But I will establish what? First time the word covenant is used. Next week we're going to talk about the covenant. I don't think we're going to get to it tonight. But very important term. Uh, I think God made a covenant with Adam, but the word covenant is not used. But with Noah, with Abraham, with Moses, with David, with Jesus, covenant, covenant, covenant. We talk about the old covenant, the new covenant. It's, it all starts here with Noah. Uh, verse 19, Every living thing of all flesh you shall bring two of every sort into the ark and keep them alive with you. Verse 20, And birds according to their kinds... Remember that word kind, not according to their species, but according to their kinds. Just the vocabulary is not accidental. Um, verse 22, Noah did this. Chapter 7, verse 6, Noah was 600 years old. <laughs> Amazing. Verse 11 of chapter 7. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, there's two things that happen. All the fountains of the great deep burst forth. So waters under the earth through either earthquakes or fissures or continental shifts waters began to come out of the earth, not just rivers and streams, but the deep, the fountains of the great deep. And the windows of heaven were opened. Remember, it had not rained. I'll look at that in a moment. In Genesis 2, it says there was no rain. It's very, there, so, but there was waters over the earth, waters under the earth, they came up from below, and for 40 days, it was a torrential downpour. Apparently, enough water to cover the entire earth. That's not a local flood, a global flood. This is a serious cataclysm. Um, for 40 days and 40 nights, and look at verse 16. And those that entered, male and female, of all flesh, went in the ark as God commanded them. And what? The Lord shut the door. Uh, my translation says the Lord shut them in. But God's the one who closed the door. That's so dramatic. And if you visit the ark in Williamstown, Williamstown, Go to the door. It's, it'll make you weep. Almost when you, and they just talk about the door and what that represents. On the inside, how beautiful the door is. We're safe. God has saved us from 
something horrible on the outside, what a terror it is to realize it's too late. I, I can't get to the one place of safety, the door. Um, verse 19, And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. I think that means Mount Everest. I think that means Mount Rainier. I think that means all the mountains on the whole earth. I think that's what the text is saying. Uh, and this passage drives people crazy. I mean, it's just like, it's, it just sort of blows your circuits what is being said. And the waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits, about 22 feet. So if, I, if, if it's saying what I think it's saying, Mount Everest was at least, the waters were 22 feet above Mount Everest. Okay? Uh, this is dramatic. I, and I love the way you're, you're following this. Chapter 8. And God, but God remembered Noah. Um, and I just, at the ark encounter, if you visit the, I hope you'll all go visit the ark. But they sell t-shirts. And the t-shirt says, God remembered Noah. That's just... Um, and verse 4, And the ark came to rest. The word rest, I never saw until I was studying this, but is a very important word in Scripture. Sabbath rest, Canaan rest, of... Come to me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Well, the ark rested on Ararat, which is a 17,000-foot peak. If it was on that mountain, it says the mountains of Ararat. Um, and the waters continued to abate until the 10th month. Verse 6 and following, God's uh, Abraham, uh, <laughs> who's this guy? Noah. Noah sent a raven, then he sends a dove, and then he sends the dove again. It's this, you know, you remember the story. And then verse 15, Then God said to Noah, Go out from the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds, animals, every creeping thing that creeps, on the earth that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply. Same thing that was said on the sixth day of creation to Adam and Eve. Be fruitful and multiply. He's starting over. This is a recreation. Be fruitful, multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out by families from the ark. And Noah built an altar. And sacrificed, <laughs> sacrificed some of the animals he had brought. But he brought extras anticipating this moment. It's, it's an amazing story. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, incidentally, if you're new, we go to 8.15. All right, so I've got a clock right up there, and I do my best to respect everyone's time. I always over-prepare, but let's dive in. Uh, most, well, let me, let me begin this way. When I visited, I've been there twice now, but the ark... When people come, drive from New York to visit us, they often say, can I go see the ark? So we've gone several times to, with people to see the ark. It's very interesting. Um, but the first time I went, by far, the room that just grabbed me, they have all these exhibits, probably 60 different exhibits as you go through the ark of just different, is the, is the display uh, called the fairy tale ark. Anybody been there? Do you remember this room? I've got several. Not nah, yeah. It's the, it's called the fairy tale ark, and you go in this room about half the size of this room probably, and it's filled. The wall is with probably 150 children's 
books of Noah and the ark. And they're all of smiling animals and a happy Noah and this cute little story that we love to read to our children and grandchildren. And then basically the message of the room is, what are we communicating when we turn the story of wrath and judgment into a fairy tale? And I just sort of stood fixed and I said, I have never had that thought in my life. I said, that's a very good question. Most children's books and Sunday school songs, I thought about asking Danny tonight to sing, The Lord said to Noah, there's going to be a flood. But you hear how cute it is? And I'm not on a crusade here against cuteness. But this is not a cute story. In fact, this, this is a very troubling story. Very troubling. Um, depicts the story of Noah and the flood as a delightful tale of smiling animals on a cruise ship. <laughs> it comes across as a cute fairy tale. This has tragic consequences when it blinds people to the historicity, to use a big word, this is history. This happened. People died in this flood. I mean, I think millions. Animals died. Things were destroyed. Continents were rearranged. The Grand Canyon was formed. I mean, this was the, the Himalayan mountains, I think, were... This was a cataclysmic event. When we make it a cute story, it has the consequence of blinding people to the historicity of a real event when a holy God judged a sinful earth by sending a cataclysmic, horrifying flood. And my footnote there to get a small idea of the flood's horror, think of the Indian Ocean earthquake and tsunami that hit Southeast Asia December the 26, 2004. Remember the images? They will not leave my mind. I mean, I have some video clips of people trapped in debris and the horror. And a quarter of a million people died in that flood. Now that pales in comparison. But the images of that tsunami, I think, is what we should think of, not a cute little pleasure cruise with animals. Uh, by treating Noah's Ark and the Flood as fairy tales rather than sobering reminders of divine judgment on a sin-filled world, these storybooks frequently trivialize the Lord's righteous and holy character. Uh, let me keep moving. The flood is a big word, but decreational or decreation. I put a hyphen in it. I read it in one of the books and I thought that was a good word. In Genesis 1 and 2, God created. In Genesis 6 and 7, God decreated or uncreated. <coughs> And the vocabulary is intentional in Scripture when you read the vocabulary. God is undoing what He has made and causes the earth to revert to its pre-creation state when the earth was tohu and bohu. We studied that the first or second Sunday. Formless and void and darkness covered the face of what? The deep. In other words, Genesis 1 and 2, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, the globe, once he creates the heavens and the earth, the earth is a watery globe. There's no firmament. There's no separate. It's just watery globe. Well, that's what happened in the flood. God said, we're going to do it again. I, I think that's what God was saying. Um, the primordial deep for the Hebrews has always been a source of fear and terror and water seen as a sort of enemy. I'd love to talk more about that, but look at my footnote. Um, think about the pivotal moments at the Red Sea. What were they facing? 
water. And water's scary. It's, um, think about the Jordan River. And it was at flood stage when they came to the Jordan River. Think about the story of Jonah. It was the water. And Jesus, when he calmed the sea, remember what the disciples said? Who is this? The sea obeys him. It's like, that's the point. Yet yeah, it, it just makes you smile. It's like, that's, and then I never understood Revelation 21 where it says, and I saw the new Jerusalem because old things had passed away. And then it has this line, and there was no more sea. If you like, I guess, the beach and the ocean, heaven may not be the place you want to go. <laughs> I, don't, I don't quite know what to do with that. But, uh, but it's the picture of the deep, the abyss, the unknown, and Leviathan, the dragons that come out of the, uh, and some of that's myth, but you read in the Job, it's a lot of stuff about the deep. Well, that's what was happening in the flood. God was undoing what he had done. He was decreating. Uh, I love the way you're looking at me right now because you're all just, you're, you're processing this. I want you to. Um, so, um, what this story is really about, and this is what we're going to talk about next week. Uh, this, uh, I'll do better if I just stick with my notes. Uh, but what this story is really about, the story of Noah and the flood begins at the dawn of human history and aims to anchor us. In other words, this is where sort of the story of humanity begins. And God says, I don't want you to miss this. In three foundational realities that must form the bedrock of all human thought and life. If I understand the story, God is saying, don't miss these three things. One, the depth of human sin. The problem is worse than you think. The earth is corrupt. Every intent of the thoughts of our hearts is only evil all the time. It is... The sin problem is a mega problem. And most Americans and most evangelicals have a very superficial understanding of sin. Most, most people in church think, I'm a basically good person who occasionally does inappropriate things. But I'm basically a good person. The Bible says, think deeper. You are basically a no good, low down, dirty, rotten bum who occasionally does good things. <laughs> Let's, it's, that's really how the Bible, the problem is really bad. And God starts off human history saying, I want you to understand how bad the problem is. Cain killed his brother at church. Lamech was a polygamist. Uh, the earth was violent. It was a, not a pleasant place to live. Okay. Human persons are deeply fall, fa flawed, greatly fallen from their original design. Every intention of the thoughts of our hearts is only evil all the time. However, it is possible to live a holy life in an unholy world because we know about Noah. And we also last spring met a fellow named Enoch who also walked with God in this wicked world. We're going to talk about that next week. All right. Number two, God wants us to anchor us in the terror of divine wrath. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. I mean, it's, uh, though God is long-suffering and patient, there is a tipping point when his wrath against sin and rebellion spills out in judgment, in fury. It's very uncomfortable to think about God in those terms, but God wants to begin human history saying, let's just, I want you to be clear about what my attitude is toward rebellion and disobedience and arrogance and those who want to be their own God. I just want you to know where I stand. <laughs> it's like, sir, yes, sir. It's, uh... And number three, 
God wants to anchor us in the lavishness of God's grace. But Noah found grace. Even in the worst conditions of sin and rebellion, God reaches out to redeem. And there may not be a better illustration of salvation by grace through faith in all the Bible than the ark. It's just, just come in the ark. Come through the door and let the pitch, the covering you with pitch, I'm going to come back to that, and to protect you from the coming wrath. Flee from the wrath to come. It's, uh, and God says we're, we're going to begin human history with those three lessons. The depth of sin, the terror of wrath, and the lavishness of grace. Don't miss this. Isn't that good? That's next week. We're gonna, that's what the story is about. Now, yeah, come back next week when we will examine what the text is really about. Now, this is just sort of for fun. Of secondary interest. So what I'm going to tell you now is really things that the story's not primarily about, but oh my goodness, are they interesting. And I, so I'm just sort of going to give a... And if you visit the ark, I keep saying this, but it just, you see it, you say, this is so interesting. Even if you disagree with what they're saying, and I, you're free to do that, but it is so intellectually stimulating. Yes, the main message we are to receive from the story of Noah and the flood concerns wrath and sin and grace. However, that's next week. We're going to hit that hard. However, as with perhaps no other story in all scriptures, this story is packed with information of secondary importance that is very, very interesting. At least for me. I just, it's, it's incredible. It's, it's scientifically, historically, zoologically, geologically. I mean, this story just hits all the buttons. I, they lived in the water. They're not in the ark. They're not yet. Because my understanding is the fish and all things that live in water were not included in what was in the ark because they survived. Birds, insects. And again, when you, when you actually see it in the ark, you know, how would they actually fit? And what the, how did they feed them? What did they do with the waste? Did they get ventilated air? How did they get fresh water? It's, it's like, it's, it's, and I, it's interesting, very. For example, the story introduces us to questions involving, and so I'm just going to touch on this. I'm, not, I'm an authority on nothing here. I'm just telling you this just comes out of the text. For example, history. Many think of ancient man as brutish and unintelligent. Caveman, you know, carries a club, grunts, scratches pictures on the cave wall, Neanderthal. It's, it's, we were all taught this. Ignorant, animal-like. That is not the way Genesis 1 to 5 describes the pre-Diluvian there's a big word for it, the pre-flood civilization. The Bible describes people before the flood as having an advanced civilization. And we looked at this last spring. Uh, musical instruments, works in bronze and irons, uh, skills at boat building. Do you know how much skill it took to build the ark? I mean, this is technology on steroids. Um, number two, another historical thing is there are over, at least according to what I've read, 200 legends. The blank is 200 legends in different cultures all over the world. Not just the Near East, the Middle East, but Africa, South America, the Pacific Islands, stories 
handed down as legends or even myths, but of a flood. This is really interesting. Uh, of an ancient flood have been discovered around the world. The most famous one uh, uh, is probably the Gilgamesh epic. Uh, Google this and you can, this is from ancient Mesopotamia. The, the most, the, it's dated to 2100 BC is at least the, uh, not necessarily when the flood was, but when the, when the record of that story, uh, but about a man named Gilgamesh, and, but, and a flood, and a boat, and animals, and birds sent out of the boat, and when, he com when the man comes out of the boat, he offers sacrifices, and the gods, it says, gathered like flies around the sweet-smelling aroma. It's like, that's a lot of similarities to what we read. And theologians and historians, you know, do all kind of things with what do you do with that. But let me just tell you, it's interesting, very interesting and important. Uh, there's great variation in these stories, but many speak of similar themes. The gods are upset and send a flood to destroy the earth. A hero builds a boat or at least something that floats. <laughs> and incidentally, Noah did not build a boat. Noah built an ark. An ark is not a boat. It, and it had no rudder. It had no sail. But it did float, and it was the right shape to make it seaworthy. We're going to get back to that. But the, the scripture does not call Noah's construction a boat it calls it an ark and that's why I say it's just like that's that's important um, birds are sent out and after the flood the survivors make a sacrifice okay so history is important another item but that's not what the story is about the story is not about teaching you history although at a secondary level, those questions are, oh my goodness, are interesting. Also, geology. The story is not about geology, but oh my goodness, just some of these things. There was no rain on the earth before the flood. Uh, lest you don't believe me on this, at least in the Garden of Eden, it says... When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land. It's like, that's sort of random. But when you get to the flood, and when the floodgates of heaven are opened, suddenly that verse is... That's interesting. That's a geological or an, an a, talk about, anyway, okay. Apparently, there was a vast vaporous canopy of water around the earth. Um, I'm not going to reread Genesis 1, but he talks about the firmament between the waters, not about between Europe and America but the waters above the earth and the waters below the earth. There was a firmament on day two, I think, of creation. I think it was day two. It's like, okay, what does that mean? Well, I don't know exactly, but there was some sort of canopy, and those who studied this say that might have meant ultraviolet rays were filtered out. It probably meant uniform temperature on the whole earth, and could account for people living for centuries rather than dying at age 120, which they started to do after the flood. After the flood, the lifespan dropped dramatically. It's like, that is fascinating. That's, and the science of it. Can you tell I'm excited about this? I, uh, um, this could have provided a uniform tropical climate, a greenhouse effect and may help to explain long lifespans of the antediluvians. The Bible describes two sources of water that covered the earth. On, the day, on that day, all the fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven. Um, these waters from above 
and from below were sufficient to cover the entire planet with water. The scriptures are clear that this was a global flood, not a local flood. And you may not fully grasp the importance of that question, but geologically, <laughs> historically, and even biblically, that's just an important question. Are we talking about a local flood or a tsunami? Or are we talking, uh, something I was reading said, you know, a lot of scientists think there was a global flood on Mars. There's all these stream beds supposedly on Mars and people seem to be sort of quick to say, well, there may have been a time when Mars was just formed and shaped by water. But when it comes to the earth, those same scientists would say, nah, that's too much like Noah. That's too much like the Bible. That can't be true. It's a, just, just get reading this stuff and you'll never get out of it. Um, but this is not what the story is about. That's the point I'm making. It's interesting and it's important. And our view of scripture to some degree hinges on how we handle these questions. Yeah. It's, and when you start ready, studying scripture, I'm just amazed at how precise the vocabulary is. Just to say, Noah didn't build an ark, a boat. He built the vocabulary choice is in, and the, the firmament. These are words. Okay. Number three, the flood waters would have had power to shape continents. Layers of rock and sediment stretch across entire continents, and many of these layers can be found on other continents and well. How do you account for the layer, the stratification, you know, in the American West is similar to the stratification, say, in Asia? That's just a very interesting question. Well, if there was a global watery cataclysm, that that's a very interesting way to answer that question. It's not the way it's typically answered in your science, high school science class. Um, and number four, the Grand Canyon, for example, has vertical walls. If the Grand Canyon were millions of years old, wouldn't the erosion have sloped them, is the argument. Why are they so straight? This seems to indicate they were carved quickly. The canyon also has a many, is many times wider. I remember going and looking at, it's like, what, 10 miles across? I mean, it's huge. And then you look, there's the Colorado River, and just say, how did that, well, the flood answer is, no, it wasn't just the river. It was huge amounts of water eroding. Yeah, it, these, these are just fascinating questions. Are you feeling blessed tonight? <laughs> this is not what the story is about. Uh, C, boat building. Oh, my goodness. This, this is an interesting one. The word ark is the same Hebrew word used to describe the ark in the bulrushes. Moses' mother hid him from Pharaoh and she put him in an ark. Our translations typically say a basket, but it's the word ark in Hebrew. Same word. It is not the word used for the ark of the covenant. It's not the same Hebrew word. And it's not the word for boat. And the ark was waterproofed, covered inside and out with pitch. Now, look at my footnote. The word pitch is Hebrew ko koper. In its verb form, it means to cover, and the word is used in the Old Testament to describe atonement like Yom Kippur, day of of atonement, the day of covering. It's when your sins are covered, when you're covered from the wrath of God against sin. Well, the ark had a covering. I, 
that's just interesting. What do you do with that? It makes me want to worship. It's like it's the pitch on the ark covered the inhabitants so the wrath did not reach them just as the blood of sacrificial lambs covered the sins of those who worshipped. Um, number two under boat building, design. The ark was designed for stability, safety, and strength and seaworthiness. I mean ocean going. This is not something you put in your pond. This is for rough weather. It was not designed for speed. There's no sail, no oars, or navigation. There was no rudder. And the first time I realized, I said, there's, no, there's no rudder on this thing. And it's like God just sort of smiles at you and says, nope, that's, that's right. Why do you think that is, Stan? And to ask a good question, you know, is to lead you to the right answer. God, I guess that means you're the pilot. And it's like dimensions, roughly 510 feet by 51 feet by 85 feet in width. Uh, if you Google this online, it'll compare the ark like to, to the Titanic or to seagoing boats. And the dimensions, though they're different, but they're proportionately length and width and height. This is a seaworthy vessel. Uh, roughly the length of one and a half football fields and four stories tall, these dimensions correspond to modern ocean going ships. I'm going to mention it in a moment, but in the other legends of the world, the, the floating contraptions that the hero builds, one builds a raft. Another one uh, in the Gilgamesh epic, they build a cube. It's perfectly square. It's like, I think that's going to turn over when a wave hits it. Um, another one is a canoe, one in the, in the Polynesia. The, 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 the Noah figure builds a canoe. You know, well, how many animals are you going to take with you? And uh, you know what a coracle is? A coracle is a, they use them in whales, it's a, it's a round, a bowl. It's a bowl, exactly, it's a bowl. Yeah, yeah, like Reefa Cheap, good, exactly, exactly. That's very good. That's where I first met that word. Uh, but in one of the tales, it's an oracle. But a coracle. Um, oh, there it is. I've, excuse me, I've got it right there. But four, capacity. The ark's capacity was approximately 1.88 million cubic feet, which means nothing to me, but this helps. Large enough to contain nearly 450 semi-truck trailers. That's big. And there's three levels, three decks. When compared to the vessels described in other legends of the flood, Noah's Ark stands out. The boats of other legends were either small, unsound, unstable, or unseaworthy. And that's, uh, a, there's a raft, a canoe, a cube-shaped Ark, and a coracle. Um, let me just, zoology, God specified the animals were to be gathered according to their kinds. So if the question is, well, how did, there's a lot of species, you know, how did he get them all on the ark? Would they fit? Well, again, visit the ark encounter. Visit, it, I don't know if they got it all right, but they've thought about this a lot. And they focus on this word kind, and a kind is a broader category than a species. A kind would include many species. So they have a, on the dark ark, for example, a dog kind. They don't have a St. Bernard and a Chihuahua and a Labrador Retriever and a Poodle. They've got just a kind and dog. And the assumption is after the flood, when the dog kind was released, they began to populate, and then the species began to develop from that. The, uh, the fossil record, I mean, each of these categories, if you've got grandchildren and they like science, 
Just point them to this. Get them, get them you know, where there are dinosaurs on the ark. Get them on these questions. These are serious questions that are very interesting, regardless of how you answer them. The fossil record. Popular thought claims that fossils are formed over long periods. It takes millions of years to make a fossil. Uh, an animal dies, slowly buried in sediment. The bones eventually become mineral and are fossilized. A global flood assumes that the animals would have been buried rapidly, and millions of them. Thus, not given time to decompose, the flood would have produced accumulating layers of sediment, in, and in these layers would be buried bodies of millions of animals who had been fossilized. It gives an entirely new perspective to look at it. It's um, the Ice Age. <laughs> I just a global flood would have a huge impact on climate change, to use a buzzword today. The Ice Age may be explained as the period after the flood when the earth was readjusting to new, there's no longer this canopy. Now there's rain, now there's, the continents are in new places. It's, how does this affect climate? Very interesting question. And then we're going to talk about this probably two weeks from now, the origin of tribes and languages and nations. It is interesting to note that Mount Ararat is roughly the geographical center of at least three continents, and some would say of all five continents. If you, and if during the Ice Age there were ice bridges between the continents for migration, it's like that. That's just, that intrigues me. Whew. Okay, that's what it's not about. But I, I, I think it's interesting enough to talk about. Why it's important, and let me just try to do this in, in big terms. Let's close with this, Roman numeral three. Why it's important to study Noah and the flood. Not what is the study about, but why is it important? Let me give you three reasons and send you home. A, this story, this is going to be, surprise you. This story helps us to understand the meaning of our baptism. It's like, wow, where did that come from? The Apostle Peter. That's exactly what Peter says. In destroying the earth with water, God is washing the world of its sinfulness and starting over. That sounds rather baptismal to me. Listen to how Peter use, uh, uses the flood as a metaphor for baptism. This is from 1 Peter. Eight persons were brought safely through water. Think of that preposition, through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Skip down to my closing words. Peter is saying that in a manner analogous to Noah, we are saved from water by water. That just makes me stop and sort of smile. Noah was saved from water by water, through water. I, uh, at Loudonville, where I was the pastor, we immersed people. Uh, we'll talk about baptism another time, but in baptism class, particularly with some of the the men in the church, but I would threaten, threaten them in baptism class. You know, if you if you mess with Pastor Stan, I'm going to drown you in that pool <laughs> when you, because it's it's a symbol, actually, of drowning and being raised again. The water and and Peter just captures this. That's what baptism means: saved from water by water. The water that destroys the wicked delivers the believer. 
Why else is it important to study this story and this one? I'd love to talk with you. The story helps us to realize our need for a deeper work. And I, I struggled to find another way to say it, but that's the best way I know how to say it. Of grace. As wonderful as God's grace is to save us from wrath, the story is crystal clear, and we're going to see it next week. This does not fully deal with the problem of sin. And I struggle to understand what God was doing when he said, I'm upset at sin, I'm going to wipe it clean and start again. But he starts again, and first thing that happens is Noah gets drunk and lies naked in his tent, the original Kentucky redneck, I guess. <laughs> that was for free. But it's like, Noah... And this is after the flood. He, gets, he plants a vineyard. He drinks the alcohol, gets drunk, lies naked in his tent. We're gonna, that's a really hard story, but we're going to get to it in a couple of weeks. Uh, and God says, and people still heart is evil. And the, the next big story that we're going to see in about four weeks is the Tower of Babel which is the founding of the city of Babylon, which is the, the incarnation of evil on planet Earth. Babylon, the great prostitute. The book of Revelation. It's all about Jerusalem and Babylon, a tale of two cities. Babylon is the picture of... And that's right after the flood. It's like, well, it didn't work. <laughs> it feels like. I and I still don't understand all of this. So the story helps us realize a need for a deeper work of grace. Now listen to the rest. It will take more than a water baptism to fix the sin problem. I've never thought of Noah's flood like that until about 1 o'clock this afternoon. Genesis will introduce us to a deeper work of grace that transforms character. It doesn't just save us from wrath. It transforms character in the story of Jacob. I can't wait to get there when Jacob wrestles with the angel. Jacob is a jerk. Um, he's the poster child of a, of a con manipulative, egotistic Christian. He's one of the patriarchs. And his, but his character is awful until he has a wrestling match with God. So stay with us. We're going to get there in about maybe Groundhog Day or something like that. <laughs> um, and then Joseph is transformed from being a victim to being a victor. I still remember David Siemens preaching on Joseph, from victim to victor. That just sort of stuck with me. It was a, if anybody was a victim, it was Joseph. But his was transformed. He was a sterling young man. Okay, uh, so it takes more than water baptism. And number two there, as for dealing with the earth and its global corruption, it will require more than a bath of water it will demand a cleansing by fire. After the flood, God said, I'm never going to do that again. But I am going to judge the world. But the next time, it's not going to be with water. It's with fire. That just sounds like Pentecost to me. John the Baptist baptized with water. When the Son of Man comes, he will baptize with fire. It's like, wow. You mean water baptism leads to something else. Yes, yes, Noah's still pretty messed up, actually. Um, and finally, I got to, oh, I've, I've broke my promise to you on the first night. This story gives us, let her see, the causes of God's first great act of judgment. In other words, why did he do that? Jesus wants us to learn from history and recognize the signs 
that will alert us to when the day of the Lord and final judgment is about to fall on the earth. This is what Jesus said in Matthew 24. As For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field, one taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one left. Therefore, conclusion, stay awake. You don't know when the Lord is coming and when the door is going to be shut. Powerful. The days of Noah help us understand what it will be like in the days just prior to the coming of the Son of Man. If we see similar conditions in our day, we should be alert because the final judgment is about to come. Um, I'll let you look those up. I'm gonna, uh, we're going to close there. Uh, I'll get the answers online, but we don't have to get all the answers. That's a... I wish you knew how much fun I had teaching a class like this. Thank you for the privilege. Hey, let me, let me pray, okay? Father, thank you for how stimulating, mentally stimulating, Bible study can be. But thank you most of all for reminding us of something that is incredibly sobering and serious, and that is the wrath to come. Thank you for the days of Noah and how it's not just interesting history, but Jesus said, if we'll remember those days, it'll make us ready for when the world is judged by fire and when the sky is open and you return in glory to judge the quick and the dead. Thank you for your word. Continue to speak to us even as we sleep tonight. Let it fill our hearts and uh, give us the wisdom that comes from walking with you. Keep us safe as we travel home and bring us together again in Jesus' name. Amen.